Hey, this is Andy Hill from the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, and when I'm not singing Disney karaoke songs with my kids at home, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I feel the need, the need for speed. You know why? It's Top Gun Day, stackers, and as your wingman, I intend to inject a healthy dose of Top Gun into this podcast for your listening pleasure. Have you ever wanted a better job or maybe just a job? Today, we'll share all that with our job creation wingman, Kevin Kiley. Plus, it's clear that the economy has been majorly impacted by COVID-19. You think? But what's going to change for us all long term? We'll share a major media story that outlines some proposals during our headline segment. Of course, we'll toss out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener, and I'll still find a way to hit you with some armed forces related trivia. And now, two guys who are just begging me to suit up with them every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It's Joe and Oh, Jujud, Jujud, G. Not only are we begging Doug to suit up, we got the suits on. We're ready to go. You feel the need for speed? That's me flexing like ice, man. <laughs> it's so uncomfortable. Dude who makes it uncomfortable right away. That is the voice of OG. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, I'm Joe Money on Twitter. Oil also, not oh. olive oil. Oh, boy. You want to go play just some? Gonna play volleyball. <laughs> I was just going to ask you if we were going to play beach volleyball now. I just got done. Yes. I was playing right over there. There. Yeah. Or maybe over there. Yeah. Highway to the danger zone. Welcome to Wednesday on the show. Hump day. Although I don't know if hump day really matters anymore in this malaise that is every week being close to the same. But heck, we're on our way to something, possibly some weekend thing that might be happening coming up. <laughs> One foot in front of the other, Joe. Yes. No matter whether it's the middle of the week, the end of the week, whenever, you can find out all the things happening here in the basement on the Stacker. That's our newsletter. Uh, head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Stacker for that. Plus, you'll get the story of all Joe's crazy mess ups. We've had a bunch of fun the last couple of weeks. Welcome to all of our new Westwood One friends as we join the Westwood One network. That has been entertaining, except for the fact that we nearly lost our back catalog OG and longtime listeners just received a hundred bonus episodes in a couple of days. So that's all good. Of them. <laughs> Try to listen to all those people and big apologies there, but uh, we nearly lost the back catalog and the only way to get it done. We finally, unfortunately decided was to bring every episode over manually. But not only did you have a chance to go revisit the old days today, we got Kevin Kiley on OG. He's going to tell us as we're either looking for a new job, maybe contemplating grad school, thinking about life and our career, how do we make the right impression? Kevin Kiley's an expert in that. Okay. Can't wait to talk to him, but first we have a couple headlines. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. Our first headline comes to us from Investment News. So you think that us going after the back catalog was tough. This might be a little tougher. Invesco to repay. We're not Invesco. Yeah. I knew this was coming. I saw, I saw this headline a couple of days ago, and I thought, this is going to make it to the show. Yeah. Joe might pick this one. Invesco to repay $105 million to correct botched index fund rebalancing. A delay caused by the COVID-19 pandemic triggered a costly mix-up, says Jeff Benjamin. The piece starts, Invesco's ponying up approximately $105 million to make investors in an index fund whole following a botched quarterly rebalancing that caused the fund to lag the index by roughly 170 basis points during the last week of April. Uh, 170 basis points for those of you not into the financial nerdery. Uh, that would be uh, 1.7%, which by the way, OG compounded 
1.7% return difference. Not that big a deal up first, but over 10 years, that could be a ton of money. Well, if it, if, the, if it was the meme recurring. That I saw, the meme that I saw about this said, usually people pay active managers $100 million to underperform the market by 1.7%. <laughs> No, <laughs> usually, usually Invesco gets paid to do that. This is demonstrating some of the problems with indexing, although it's never this bad, of course. But when you index, you're an index fund manager, your performance is based on what's called tracking error. Your job is to try to get as close to the closing price as possible because then you have a small tracking error. You know, you look at your Vanguard fund, that's the S&P fund, and then you look at the real S&P you want those numbers to be as close as possible and they're off by a little bit. There's some expense ratios issue in there. And then there's the trading costs and the timing of that trade. So you have to get really close. And obviously uh, the Invesco folks not going to be earning their quarterly bonus this quarter because their tracking error was off by so much. Quarterly rebalancing the piece says, which normally takes place in the last Friday of the quarter was delayed until April 24th due to the extreme stock market volatility at the end of March. Doesn't that happen automatically though? The rebalancing or? Yeah, the rebalancing. It would seem like on an index, it would just automatically rebalance. But of course, shifts all over the place. Maybe they were. Yeah, at the end of March, they they did pause that for, that was that was a universal thing. That wasn't just in Besco. That was the S&P saying that they weren't even going to do it until April. The $5.6 billion Invesco equally weighted S&P 500 fund is designed to track the S&P 500 equal weight index, but somehow fell out of sync on Monday, April 27th, following the rebalance by more than 30 basis points. And then on Tuesday, April 28th, it fell to 60 basis points and then another 83 basis points on Wednesday, April 29th. Somebody pushed the wrong button. Oops. Looks like Earl's getting fired. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Back to Peoria, Earl. But when it comes to index funds. I mean, I love this idea of set it and forget it, OG, but this is another case of, well, they're going to make it right. They're going to make investors whole. You, you still kind of got to know what you're getting into. The whole game with index funds is tracking error. There's nothing else associated with it. You're not trying to do better. You're not trying to do worse. You're just trying to do this exact same as best as you can. But like we talked about on Monday, you've got these different, uh, you know, let's go back to oil again. You've got these index funds tracking oil and the two biggest ones, the Invesco one, the second biggest one, slightly more expensive, five one hundredths of one percent more expensive, I believe. So a lot of people not using that. They're using the cheapest one, ticker symbol USO, instead of ticker symbol DBO. Two indexes, OG, that supposedly do the same thing. And USO is uh, a raging forest fire. <laughs> well, there's obviously some differences within them, whether they use leverage or whether they use derivatives within the product in and of itself. Everything's a little bit different too, just because, I mean, you highlighted it, you kind of glossed over it here. This is the S&P 500 equally weighted index mutual fund. I mean, there's an index is just, you have to substitute the word index for list. It's just a list. It's a list produced by a company, in this case, Standard & Poor's, and Standard & Poor's sells the list. And companies want to match the list. You and I could create a list of stocks that we wanted to have as an index. For example, it'd be like Woodford and Miller Lite and Bud Light and Jack Daniels and Jim Beam and Marlboro. Like that would be our index. <laughs> we'll call it the Friday Night Party Pack the, Index. The Stacking Benjamins Basement Index. Exactly. We should we should do that. We should, we, uh, there's gotta be some site, maybe, maybe on a uh, motif, we could create like all the garbage that Doug eats index. Yeah, like hostess. <laughs> Fritos. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be so bad. But it's just a list. So, yeah, you know, and there's different people that make different lists. So you're not getting the exact same thing every time when you see a S and P 500 fund, it's not necessarily the same thing as every other S&P 500 fund because I might use a slightly different list. Let's do one other thing. This was a problem with the S&P 500 equal weight index. And I know there's people that are wondering, I almost said people in their car, not, not that many people in their car. There might be people hanging out in their basement today, OG, wondering 
What's the difference between the S&P 500 index and the S&P 500 equal weight index? What's that all about? Well, simplistically enough, the equal weighted index is just going to take every stock and divide it by however many there are. So 505 or whatever the number is, the fund is going to be equally weighted. In reality, however, the S&P 500 is predominantly overweighted in Amazon and Microsoft and Google and Netflix. And I think there's one other one that I'm forgetting. But if you have the S&P fund that's matching the S&P, you're going to get the S&P return. If you have an S&P fund that's equally weighted, some people think that's a little bit more pure because you're not taking any bets within that S&P list. But, you know, teach his own. This is all gobbledygook anyway. But good on Invesco for ponying up 100 mil. You know, if you got an extra 3 million or something, throw it our way. What's 100 mil between friends? Yeah, you know, we, we don't need 100. I mean, I don't be greedy. That's what we always say. 3, 4 million would be more than adequate. Our second headline uh, comes to us from CNBC. I wanted to bring this up because of uh, the bane of my existence that social media has become the last few weeks. This is written by Jesse Pound. Leon Cooperman says the coronavirus crisis will change capitalism forever and taxes have to go up. Billionaire investor Leon Cooperman said Thursday on CNBC Squawk Box that the coronavirus crisis will likely change capitalism forever and that taxes will need to be raised soon. When the government's called upon to protect you on the downside, they have every right to regulate you on the upside, Cooperman said. So capitalism has changed. The chairman and CEO of the Omega family office said the country's shifting to the left and the taxes will have to go up regardless of who wins the presidential election in November. And then it goes on. And, and this is what the rest of it says. Blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah. Good thing I got my billion before that happened. Yes. I locked Phew. mine in. Who cares about the rest of you? Here's the reason I want to bring this up, OG. You know, you know, because you talk to people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, people spend very little time worrying about the stuff they can control, and they worry a ton about junk pieces like this. Oh, so-and-so said that life is changing forever. I can no longer make any money. I can't, there, there is, there is no way that I could ever become a millionaire because Leon Cooperman said that, man, it's over for us. Yeah. How fun, right? Such an inspiring piece. I have found in just the conversations we've had over the last couple of weeks, you know, we started doing those kind of 30 minute check-ins basically. And we'll probably do that another couple of weeks, I guess. But um, it's almost like sometimes if you had that situation where, you know, you're like on a, well, in your case, maybe on a bender and your buddy has to like grab you by the shoulders and go, no, don't do that anymore. Like that's what I kind of feel like some of this stuff is because you get sucked into, like you said, oh my gosh, but this really awesome person, you know, Mark Cuban said, or Howard Stone, who's it, or whatever this guy's name was said, or, you know, I've read on the news that this guy thought, or my aunt on Facebook said she read that, that, uh, you know, and all of a sudden it's like fourth party sources, you know, my friend's aunt's cousin thought she saw this person doing this thing. None of that has anything to do with anything. And it's so mesmerizing how much time and energy we spend just engrossed in that yes. nonsense. We all and have the ability. Everybody wants the secret. And we all have the secret right in front of us. Kevin Kiley coming on today. You know what? Figure out how to make more money. There it is. Either figure out a raise. We, we've done stories before that show lots of bosses. Maybe not today. Today might not be a good day to ask for a raise. However, okay. in a normal economy, lots of bosses time your, time your bets a little yeah. bit differently than today. <laughs> Think a little strategically when you do that. But a lot of bosses want to give you a raise. And the problem, we don't ask. And then number two is we've got all of these uh, ways to have side hustles and uh, you could go to a competing company. You can earn more money. And then either through the power of saving through your paycheck at work or setting up an automatic investment plan that's all you need that's what you need earn more money and save more money and you too can be a millionaire i'll give you a great example of this i've had a number of conversations about this in the last several weeks you know people who are doing okay they're fortunate to be in a position that they haven't had a job loss or they haven't had income changes and they're continuing to save and invest and they're on track for their goals and and just the stuff that we focus on is just really interesting 
because it'll, you know, they'll say, well, I don't think I should do that because then, you know, then, then I can't touch that money till I'm 59 and a half. I said, well, what do you mean you can't touch the money? Well, tell me more about that. Well, you can't touch the money till you're 59 and a half. And that's like an example of taking something that has like a kernel of truth to it and then extrapolating that to all of your decision making. And I like to go to the other extreme. I'll say, okay, so play this out for me. If you had $42 million in an IRA and you had to pay a 10% penalty and you were 40, would you retire? <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, no kidding. Because you have enough money and you're like, whatever. But here's the great news. You don't have to have 42 million because in this example, the IRS isn't penalizing you for retiring. They're, they penalize you for spending your retirement money prior to retirement. If you're retiring at 40 or you're retiring at 45 and you have retirement assets, there's a way out of that penalty because guess what? You're retired. And the IRS goes, oh, well, well, if you're retired, you can use your retirement money. They're not going to penalize you for that. You just have to know how to do it. So it's like taking this little thing and then going 10 steps away from it, you know, well, there's 17 gajillion, is it quadrajillion? I don't know what we're at now, but you know, there's, there's some number. Therefore, that means that I shouldn't put money in my pre-tax Roth anymore or pre my pre-tax IRA anymore. Huh? What are you talking about? Or this means that some catastrophe is about to befall us again. Therefore, I shouldn't invest in my 401k. Huh. <laughs> How do you make that leap? You know, you got to focus on the stuff that you can control. I was talking, and I was talking the other day to uh, Tony Bradshaw, who used to be the CEO of uh, the Ramsey group. He has been a prior guest on the show. Just a fantastic guy. He told me this great story, OG, about his first mutual fund he bought. He bought a mutual fund that was, like we were talking about in our first headline, it was the wrong fund. It was a sector bet. And while the economy continued to do well and he should have been broadly diversified, he wasn't. And over the course of three years, he made no money. And he's like, you know what? I didn't make any money. My money didn't make any money. And that was a great lesson. But you know what happened? I saved $18,000. I saved $18,000. And that was of the two things. That was the important skill. Right. It was it was really cool to hear him hear him talk about that. Stop paying attention to the idiots and yahoos in the newspaper. Yeah. On CNBC. Focus on the stuff you can control. You can do it. You can all do other it. podcasts except ours. <laughs> except for podcasts affiliated with ours. You can probably listen to those, but after you listen to this one. Yes. Way after. Yes. That's probably lesson number one. Actually, that isn't lesson number one. I think lesson number one is focus on what you can control and you will get there. It might be like eating an elephant, just one little bite at a time, but you will get there. And then headline number two, investing in index funds. Invesco is about to send you a check for a hundred million. Ching. Well, maybe not you, but you and a bunch of your closest friends. Nothing I like better than people that just are straight talkers, OG. And Kevin Kiley is the definition of a guy who just tells you straight, here's the good stuff, here's the bad stuff. And uh, we're about to get his feelings on how to either A, if you're somebody who is out looking for a job, how to score that job over all the other people who are also looking for a job, how to use the tools you have right in front of you more appropriately. And then, you know, a lot of people right now, OG, thinking about grad school. And uh, when Kevin and I were emailing back and forth about what we're going to talk about here, he said he has had more inquiries lately about grad school than kind of getting more skills. Yeah. Then he said, is this the time? You know, if I'm laid off already right now, should I just go back to school? So we'll ask him about that. His background, incredibly extensive. Uh, more than five years recruiting and evaluating talent for MBA programs at Washington University in St. Louis. He's a professional certified coach through the International Coaching Federation, a certified career coach. He coaches clients all over the world from his home office in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas. Let's say hello to our friend Kevin Kyler.
and on my dad's shortwave radio, it's our new friend, Kevin Kiley. How are you, man? Good, Joe. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a real pleasure. Well, I got a question for a guy who's in career development, executive recruiting, helping people figure out graduate school or not. Is this a busy time for you or is this an incredibly <laughs> lonely time for you? This is an incredibly busy time for me, Joe. Last week was my busiest week easily in the past two years. And I don't think that's a coincidence at all, given there's uh, an unfortunate storm, but it's a perfect storm of different uh, things going on out there related to COVID-19 that is making the interest in uh, career coaching and the interest in grad school both elevate a lot. So this is a really busy time. I'm not happy about the why, but the yeah. reality is, is that it's keeping my hands really full. Is this a time when coaching and sharpening that saw really makes a bigger difference than average? I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm sure it always makes a difference. But is this mm -hmm, a time mm -hmm. when it's really going to make a difference? I think it's going to make a really big difference. You make a great point with that. And I think one of the reasons why is because the, the forces that are at play here, especially when it comes to the job market, are such that you're going to have – more people looking for work and fewer positions available, at least in the short term. And I always coach my clients this. It's always the case that the little things are the big things. And in a competitive process like a job search, something that might seem small to you actually might be a big deal to a hiring manager or to a recruiter and could make the difference between you being selected for a job versus you going immediately into the no pile. And so, yes, this is the time we're sharpening the saw because of the increased competition that's going on out there is a big deal. And you need to be thinking about what you can be doing now to make sure that you have as few liabilities on your resume, on your LinkedIn profile as you possibly can. And sharpening the saw goes hand in hand with exactly that. Where are those places where people usually step in it? <laughs> well, uh, as far as uh, going down the wrong path, I think that sometimes one of the big things that I see is that they assume that they have the job sooner than they actually have the job. Oh. And that can be their fault. That can be just the fault of the process. But starting down the path where you're asking questions that you would not ordinarily ask until you actually have a job offer in hand are, are, is, a, is a common mistake that I see. In other words, you have to understand when you're in a job search, there's a power dynamic there, okay? And you might think that you're the greatest candidate in the world, but <laughs> until you actually have a job offer in hand, you typically have no idea who else they're talking to, what their qualifications are, where you are, and perhaps their ranking and that sort of thing. And getting ahead of yourself is a really, really bad idea. The other thing that I see people do too is they try to bluff their way through the compensation discussion. And what I mean by that is they try to um, force a company's hand by feigning that they have other job offers in hand in order to attempt to accelerate the process with the company that they really want. Mm. Unfortunately, when that company, if they actually, you know, <laughs> call their bluff, then uh, now they're really in trouble. And I, I can't ever advise doing that. But the best way to approach this sort of stuff is to be straight up and be honest with things and just let the process play out. I know that takes time. I know that takes patience. And ideally, yeah, if you're a finalist for three different positions, Ideally, you have your offer from all three, you have the compensation package, you know what the benefits are, you know what your title would be, your direct, you know, the reporting responsibility, all these things all at once. And you would be able to choose with all the information at hand and, you know, make a perfect decision. Unfortunately, it almost never works that way. And there is a timing factor. Timing is huge in the job market. I mean, look where we are right now, right? But it just even on the, in normal times, timing is huge. And you, all you can do is be honest with people. If you have another job offer, if you genuinely have it, fine. Talk to other organizations. Hey, just be honest. This is what I'm looking at. These are the deadlines that I'm looking at. Is it possible for you to do anything uh, with respect to your timeline? Uh, and just go from there. But those are the big ones that I see. I had a friend uh, who was lucky enough uh, about six months ago to have two job interviews that were going really well. He got an yeah. offer for job one on, yeah. we'll say on Tuesday, he was hoping yeah. for job offer from job two to come in any minute, but it wasn't coming in, wasn't coming in. Is there a way to stall? Well, did he, my question would be, did he communicate to job number two that he had an offer from job number one? Do, do you happen to know that? Yeah, I don't know that. No, but he should have communicated then to job number two Absolutely. that, hey, yeah. I've, got, yeah. I've got job number one waiting. Well, so so for the first question is, is the, is the offer from job number one actually viable? 
you know, is he going to be able to provide for his family? They're not going to be eating dirt. Uh, he's going to have the benefits. It's going to be a location. If there's relocation involved, et cetera, et cetera, is it a viable offer? Because if it's not a viable offer, then that kind of goes into another path. But let's assume it was a viable offer. Then we approach job or company number two in a very professional, polite, courteous way and just be honest with them. This is what I'm looking at. I've got this other offer. It's a very attractive offer and I'm seriously considering it. And I wanted to know, I'm also very interested in your opportunity as well. And hopefully you have a sense of what the timing is. And is there anything you can do so that I might be able to weigh these two opportunities against each other and just basically put the ball on their court? Either they can or they can't. Yeah. And, you know, but if, if you don't give them a fair opportunity to know if, if what's going on, then to think that their processes, the timelines are going to align you're probably kidding yourself. So most companies are savvy enough to know that you're not the only game that they're talking to, that you know sure. you probably are looking at other places. In fact, some uh, places will actually ask that as part of the interview. And so th- and they'll, they'll know that. And if you are a serious candidate for them and they really want you, depending on the organization and what they can do internally and how nimble they are, you might be looking at two offers now. So I, that's so for your friend, I hope he approached job number two that way, assuming offer from number one was viable. He actually ended up taking job number one. This is a point in the story, Kevin, okay. that I wish I knew more <laughs> because, because it would be great. It'd be great for this discussion. Uh, but let's go back the other way. What are some things that we can do to make ourselves look more attractive to an employer then? Uh, well, right now, the biggest... <laughs> Here's the thing I get a lot of, and I, I'll, I'll give you, I'll get, tell you a, an example of someone I used to coach. And this guy's name is Jeff. Jeff is an accountant by trade. He's been an accountant for 20-ish years, something along those lines. Jeff's a great dude, great interpersonal skills. If you ever, for those who are likely to think that accountants are a little short on the personality meter, <laughs> uh, Jeff is not that. Great guy, track record of success, and undergraduate degree in accounting, but never took the time to go and do his CPA and get that certification for whatever reason, you know, hey, life, family, obligations, whatever come up. So he, so, you know, Jeff didn't do it and that's fine. And he had cobbled together a pretty attractive track record and, you know, career in accounting, despite not being a CPA. Well, there comes a point about two years ago where he finds himself unexpectedly out of work through no fault of his own, just a situation with um, a merger. And he got left out or whatever like that. And all of a sudden, he was looking at these other accounting roles um, where it was all it was CPA preferred or CPA required, and he didn't have it. As it turns out, we're to fast forward to today, he has a job now with a good organization and still doesn't have a CPA. And they were able to overlook that. It turned out well for him. But what I would coach anybody in this sort of circumstance, to use Jeff as an example, is when you look at your peers, people of roughly the same amount of professional experience in the same industry and the same kind of functional role. And you look at the qualifications that they're bringing to the table and what ones do you also have and which ones do you not have. For those ones that you don't have, take a serious look at that and think about maybe I should be investing in myself in those areas. Because, you know, especially in today's uh, environment with what's going on in the economy, the, it's going to get a lot more competitive out there. And one, at some point in your career, whether it's today, three months or three years from now, you are going to be evaluated against your peer group. And those qualifications that you have on paper or otherwise, again, could be difference makers. And the more you keep putting it off, the more you keep thinking, oh, you know, it'll be OK or whatever. Hey, maybe it will. In the case of Jeff, it was okay, but unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. So I would encourage anyone to really circle back to the skills that they have, evaluate them against their peer group, and have that serious heart-to-heart with yourself, and make sure that you're uh, not kidding yourself to thinking that, oh, it's going to be okay, because honestly, over the next period of time, it's only going to get more challenging out there. It's interesting. As I listen to you talk, I'm just thinking about this kind of thorough, very honest evaluation of your strengths and weaknesses you have to make. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, the process that I usually take my clients through, uh, well, well, let me take a step back. How many times have I been approached by a, a new client, a prospective new client, 
they find me on LinkedIn or they find me through a, a friend or a former colleague or something like that. And they say, Kevin, I'm really interested in, uh, you know, your services as a career coach. I've been career searching for the past or job searching for the past, you know, three months or whatever. And I just don't seem to be getting anywhere. I'm like, okay, fine. So I do a free 30 minute call for any prospective client. And so we get on the phone and I say, okay, you know, walk me through what you've been doing or, you know, what's your strategy been so far? And <laughs> basically this is their strategy. Well, I updated my resume and uh, then I just started, uh, you know, firing out applications. I apply to, you know, five new jobs every week. Oh, okay, that's okay. Interesting. What else? What else is going on? You know, if it's a video chat or for face to face, I get like this blank stare. Or if it's on the phone, it's just like radio silence. And it's like, okay, so that's all you're doing. Oh, okay. And in certain cases, that can work. And I definitely get the fact that some people have been successful, like with that approach in the past. And so they're likely to repeat it again in the future. Totally get that. What I can tell you is that a more strategic approach to your career management and to pursuing a job is far more likely, far more likely to result in a career and a job that is much more fulfilling, that you actually look forward to going to in the morning, that you're fulfilled and you're happy with, you see yourself in there long term. So the approach that I like to take it takes a little more time. It takes a little more effort, but it's a three-step approach. And basically, I take my clients through answering three specific career questions. It's who am I? Where am I going? How will I get there? And in that order. So you start with who am I? And it's that self-evaluation thing that you mentioned, Joe. That's what we have to get into. It's what are my values? What are my skills? What are my interests? What does my ideal position kind of look like relative to those things? And so we take them through those exercises, and I assure you that taking the time, it doesn't take a ton of time, but going through some basic examination of value, skills, interests, that sort of thing is so much more likely to lead to career fulfillment. And it's so rewarding for me when at the end of the day, at the end of the process with these clients, they actually do get that job that does align with those things. It's absolutely wonderful. Well, I think then too, once you've done that and your second question around where am I going, it seems mm -hmm. like then, Kevin, you're able to much more likely narrow down the field of companies that are going in the same direction, right? I mean, the last absolutely. thing you want to do is start a job with a company where you're going to be there four months and you hate it because they're going oh. one way and you're going the opposite way. Oh, I had someone named Jessica who did that exact thing. Jessica came to me about three years ago for career coaching. <laughs> Jessica's story was that she was contacted, let's say, by a one of these uh, recruiter headhunter types and Jessica had been, you know, th the person had found Jessica on LinkedIn and, you know, liked the profile and everything as far as, uh, you know, qualifications and whatnot. And Jessica was kind of lukewarm about her current role. And she decided that this thing that just fell out of the clear blue sky into her lap would be a great thing for her to pursue. And the next thing you know, she's in the job for a few months and she's miserable and she's contacting me. And then, you know, five minutes into initial conversation, she's practically in tears because she's miserable. She got attracted by a title bump and a salary bump and hadn't done any true research into the organization about what their values are, what they were all about, what they, you know, how they treated their employees, you know, how they developed employees. Hadn't looked at any of that. Just basically went for the money and the title. Is it any surprise that she's miserable that quickly? That's a huge career misstep. I mean, not doing adequate research before you apply to a job is a huge mistake. You know, because when we talk about where am I going, I encourage people to dive a little deeper than brand names. So let's say that someone is interested in a kind of, um, oh, let's just, I'll put it to you this way. So I say, okay, what kind of companies are you interested in working at? And it's like, well, um, you know what? I'd, I'd love to work for Amazon. Okay. You know, Amazon, Amazon's a great company, big company, seems to be doing well, the whole thing. Full discovery. I, I like Amazon myself, you know, as a consumer. <laughs> so they want to work at Amazon. So they say, okay, that's interesting. So tell me a little bit more why you want to work at Amazon. Well, you know, I, I love their website. It's great. And I just think it's really cool that I can click on, you know, this product or whatever, you know, put in my credit card number. And then two days later, it's on my front step. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so any other reason why? That's just the thing. I mean, and you know, Amazon might be the greatest employer or they, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I've never worked for Amazon, but the point is, is that selecting a prospective employer is a unique process. And yeah, maybe completely different people, than the customer facing oh, completely, uh, completely. advertising. I mean, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's one of the, the payoffs I would say of the big brand name companies. And that is, is that one of the ways that they attract talent is the fact that they are a big brand name company yeah. and some workers appreciate sort of that affiliation bump. They say, Oh, I work for Google. Oh, I work yeah. for 
you know, JP Morgan or whatever, you know, whatever, they somehow they get an esteem bump almost by working for a brand prestige name organization. Totally get that. Yep. I mean, you know, at networking events or on the rest for the rest of your life on your resume or LinkedIn profile, you know, when you identify, oh, that's where I worked between, you know, 2013 and 2017. It's kind of cool to have a brand name on your resume. And that's important, I think, for some people. But I can tell you the far bigger thing is to what extent are your interests, your goals, your alignment, your value alignment aligned with the organization, much bigger and more important. You've mentioned a few times LinkedIn. You've met, we've talked about resumes a little bit. Are resumes becoming obsolete? That's a heck of a good question, Joe. They're probably taking baby steps in that direction. I think if we were going to have this conversation in 2025, I would probably laugh at myself for insinuating baby steps because maybe that's more like leaps and bounds. Um, so they are going, you, they are going away. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you said, if you held the gun to my head and said, Kevin, make a decision on this, I'd say they're probably going away, yeah. but that day is not today. So the resume is still extremely important, but one of the, <laughs> one of the interesting developments when it comes to resumes, and I say developments for this reason, resumes, the best practices around them evolve. What I would have recommended someone do or not do on their resume even five years ago could be very different today. And one of the things that we see is now established best practice on resumes is to include your LinkedIn URL at the top of the resume oh. along with you know your email address and your phone number or whatever. Well, why is that? Well, <laughs> the data shows that the majority of hiring managers and recruiters now and by majority, I mean, uh, most people think it's north of 90%. These individuals, as part of their vetting process, will seek you out online. And, okay, LinkedIn is going to be kind of the obvious place where they'll try to find you. So why not just put the LinkedIn URL right at the top of the resume? Sure. But, oh, by the way, this is another great point. As part of your getting ready to, okay, I'm going to job search, as part of that process, you need to do some cleanup of your social media. You need to do your Google yourself. Make sure that there's nothing sitting out there that is going to be uh, an embarrassment. And oh, by the way, please don't give me this. Oh, my social media, my Facebook, my Instagram is set to private. Guess what? Companies and organizations have ways around that. And just when you think something is private, it's not. If it's out there, it ain't private. Now, what does that look like? I mean, yeah, we're all allowed to have our opinions on different things, you know, and, and social media is known for that. But if, for example, just a, a high level thing here, you know, a lot of people, especially these days, there's a lot of back and forth about political things. And I'm not interested in getting any kind of political discussion. But there are certain organizations out there that kind of at a high level are more aligned with certain political feelings. And again, no one's saying that you can't have your own beliefs or whatever. But if you're political feelings as you put forth on social media are not in alignment with a, a high level view of a certain organization, that could work against you. You will never know that. Of course, they will never disclose that to sure. you. You'll just find yourself suddenly not hearing from them anymore. And uh, you may never know why, but that could be why. So um, when in doubt, take it out. I was mentoring a young guy one time and his uh, email address at that time, you know, Yahoo was the big thing. So, and, mm -hmm. and, and his, his email address, Kevin, was something like bigguns96 at yahoo.com. And, <laughs> and I told yeah. him, I'm like, you can't tell people to email you there. <laughs> you, ha you have to have a more professional sounding email than that. Joe, phenomenal. You should be a career coach. That's yeah, awesome. Right. And that's, that's totally, that's one of the things that we coach people around all the time. Uh, any career coach would do that. You know, first of all, if your email platform is still AOL or Juno, time to update. You know, that's, you know, let's get that out of there. And like, hey, like, grandpa, time oh, to. Oh, my gosh. And if it's like, you know, oh, my, my thing, like, your service is a great example. Or, you know, party like it's 1999 at right. AOL.com. I mean, no, you need to, it needs to be professional. Your avatar with your email address, you know, the photo is, you know, if you're going to be job searching, remember that could be literally the first time a prospective recruiter or hiring manager could lay eyes on you that I would encourage that to be professional. The easy way to do that is just use the profile picture that you have on LinkedIn. Use an email signature is another great one, just like you would be in your professional job, how you have an email signature with name, contact information, your LinkedIn uh, URL, have that in your personal if you're going to be doing that. And by the way, this whole concept carries over to your voicemail too. I personally 
Uh, I've worked in uh, corporate talent development. I've done a lot of hire. I've hired more than 100 different people in professional roles in my career. I can't tell you how annoying it is if you call someone and you get their voicemail and either one of two things happens. One is you get that dreaded uh, announcement that says the mailbox is full and you can't leave a voicemail. People clean that up. You know, if you're doing the job search, you need to, you know, if that could be the, that could be an offer. And now they can't, you know, say, hey, call me back. We need to speak. So get that cleaned up. And number two is the voicemail announcement itself needs to be professional. This is not the moment to have your three kids singing Baby Shark on your voicemail announcement and then say, oh, yeah, leave a message. No, no, no. It can be professional and courteous, and you don't have to have Baby Dude, Shark you, on there. You are no fun. <laughs> right. Why not make it enjoyable, right? But yeah, and that's just it. I mean, you talk to recruiters, you talk to, I mean, I'm a former director of MBA admissions. We all have horror stories out there about basically poor decisions that applicants made that just torpedoed their chances. It's not that they were bad candidates necessarily. It's just they made poor decisions and they found themselves in the no pile pretty quickly. Yeah. Take yourself seriously. Uh, let's talk about LinkedIn for a second, because okay. you've got two schools of thought on LinkedIn. Obviously, everybody goes, well, I need a LinkedIn profile, so I'm going to make my LinkedIn profile. And then I never go back on LinkedIn. There are other people <laughs> I feel like who would have a better career if they weren't on LinkedIn so damn much. <laughs> Continually, I don't know if it's networking or pontificating or whatever, but where's that line? How should we use something like LinkedIn to build our career? understand what LinkedIn is and what it isn't. I coach a lot of people who are, have a nervousness about LinkedIn because when they consider, when they think of social media, they only think of it in the terms of social, as in their social life, as in their friends and family and whatnot. And they say, Kevin, I hear what you're saying about LinkedIn, but you know, I only prefer to have you know close friends and family on there. And I say, that's great, but I think what you're thinking about there is a philosophy that is more aligned with Facebook or yeah. with Twitter, or Instagram, that kind of thing. Not all social media is created equal. LinkedIn is definitely that platform for professional things. And so there's a lot of different things that people can be doing right now. One of the biggest things uh, with respect to LinkedIn, how they can be using it, especially these days, there's a lot of people out there who are in a bad way right now professionally as far as the, their jobs and careers and whatnot goes. Uh, this is a great opportunity, first of all, to flip the script a little bit and to reach out to people. And instead of kind of that, you know, what can you do for me? What can I do for you? Hey, how are things going? I think that from a big picture these days, a lot of people are advocating for that, not just in the professional world, but just as human beings, you know, hey, there are a lot of people who are suffering right now or in a bad way. Just reach out and let them know they're thinking about you and that kind of thing. Just just real quick reach out message. You can do that on LinkedIn in a professional sense. If someone works for the ABC company and uh, you've read something recently that the ABC company is uh, undergoing furloughs, it may or may not have affected that contact you have, but hey, reach out to that person. It's a two-way street, it's interactive. So make good use of reaching out to people I think that the other big thing is that making sure that you're expanding the number of having the maximum number of contacts that you possibly can. The magic of LinkedIn has to do with the interconnectivity of it and it's who knows who. And when it comes to a job search, it's something that's really important as far as the best way that you can make sure that your application to an organization gets noticed without exception is to have an internal advocate for you inside that organization who can help raise your visibility as a candidate. Yes, you might just automatically know somebody who works at a certain organization where you would work, um, but sometimes it's not that obvious, and LinkedIn is your go-to resource for that. The point is, is that maximizing the number of connections that you have on LinkedIn is different than doing so on other social media, and I would encourage anyone, whether you're job-seeking now or not, to maximize the number of connections that you have there. That will pay dividends at some point in your professional career. I can almost guarantee it. One of your websites is a grad school roadmap. We should talk about grad school because at this point, oh, yeah. I, I think people are really thinking about, okay, do I use this opportunity if I have a pause <laughs> in my career, right? Do I use this as an opportunity to go mm -hmm. back to school? You know, we talk about cost versus benefit. How should we think about that best? Well, <laughs> that's a huge topic. And, and so the, the, for put it this way, I can tell you that you know, with Grad School Roadmap, my business partner there is Dr. Don Martin, and he and I see completely eye to eye on this, and that is, is that grad school is not for everyone. Even now, even five years ago, at any time, it's definitely not for everyone. And I think to your point, everyone has to sort of do that cost-benefit analysis. And what it really comes down to, Joe, is a question of why. 
why would I be doing this? What is the end game? What is the end in mind? You mentioned Stephen Covey earlier. What is the end in mind that I would be looking for when it comes to grad school? There are good reasons to do grad school, and there are not so good reasons to do grad school. A not so good reason would be um, uh, a newly, uh, I'm about to graduate from undergrad, and I have no idea what I want to do with myself, and I haven't done the proper work to figure out what I, my career is going to be. And I'm so laughing, therefore- by the way. I'm laughing, by the way, and not because of the fact that it's funny, but because that happens mm-hmm. all the time. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, it totally does. And there, you know, and um, for really strong academic institutions with really smart students, in many cases, they're happy to have those individuals stay around for another year or two and and do a master's degree, for example, you know, and I don't mean to suggest that anyone who stays in higher ed for another year or two after undergrad is somehow misguided. But, you know, the question is, again, I hope that they have given careful consideration as to why they're doing that. And it kind of brings to the forefront kind of the situation where it is right now. There are individuals right now is a golden opportunity for people who are thinking about an MBA, even if you're thinking about an MBA as soon as this fall. There is a very, not, not very unique, there's no stages of unique, right? It's either right. unique or it's not. Right. There's a unique opportunity. Incredibly that's unique. Form, that's my former editor. I, but before I started doing this career stuff, I was a professional editor for eight <laughs> years. And so I still feel compelled to speak in complete proper sentences. Just ask it's, my wife. It's, anyway, a, it's a curse. Um, it's a curse. <laughs> Anyway, there's a unique opportunity for grad school, especially MBA right now, which is a whole nother story. But it's it's definitely not a good opportunity. But it's again, it's not for everyone. Yeah. It, if the question is, is you know, is this part of your long term plan? As you think about what your overall career trajectory is and where you might be going and what you might aspire to be in the future, is this the kind of thing that is a necessary benchmark against where you're trying to go? Great thing for that. Once again, is LinkedIn. If you think that, oh, I want to do this kind of job at this kind of company, well, guess what? You can go to LinkedIn now and start looking at people's profiles who have that kind of job in that kind of organization, and you can reverse engineer their whole career. And what you're looking for there is trends. You don't want an isolated incident. You, you know, yes, Mark Zuckerberg founded Facebook when right. he hired Harvard Java, <laughs> but guess what? You know, I love you, but you're probably not that good. <laughs> and you're probably going to need, you know, some additional seasoning and experience before you get to that level. Go look for trends on LinkedIn and find, you know, okay, based on, you know, these five or 10 people who have the kind of career that I want, here are the kind of things that, here are the boxes that they checked along the way. And, you know, that's probably a pretty good indication that I should be doing the same thing. But of course, there's always that exception. You know, I mean, you know, again, you think of like my client, I had Jeff, who, you know, has a pretty good career in accounting, but doesn't have a CPA. Well, you know, okay, there's always that exception. But again, if we're a lot of career development is maximizing your opportunities, it's giving yourself the best odds at success. I I use the analogy a lot. And I don't I don't gamble at all. I don't know how to gamble. I never go to casinos. But as I understand it with blackjack, when you play blackjack, there's like a book, you know, there's like, you know, you, you follow a certain set of rules. And if you follow the book in blackjack, it's not a guarantee that you're going to win, but you play the odds. It gives you the best odds of success at blackjack. But there are other factors in play that even if you play a perfect by the book strategy, you can still not succeed. Career development and job searching is the exact same way. What I advocate for anyone who's looking is to basically do everything you can by the book. And what I mean by that is follow best practices to maximize your opportunities and give yourself the best possible chance for success. It's not a guarantee, but you give yourself the best possible chance. Where can people find you, man, if they need more help? So for career, uh, either a career to, uh, roadmap.com, www.careerroadmap.com, or just email me, Kevin at careerroadmap.com. I offer a free 30 minutes uh, consultation on the phone with anybody who's interested. And that's for career development, for job seeking help, or for uh, grad school. Even now, it's definitely still a chance for grad school for this coming fall, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, but I've encouraged people to reach out. I'm always happy to hear from individuals and uh, happy to have a good conversation. Well, Kevin, thanks a ton during this hugely busy time for you for helping us. I really, really it's appreciate smart. it. My pleasure, Joe. Thank you so much. And if it's not obvious, I could probably talk about this stuff all day long. So I couldn't uh, tell. I, I'm happy, happy <laughs> to do that again if the opportunity is there. Hey, stackers, it's your trusty trivia wingman, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, here to deliver your water cooler discussion package. You might as well call me Goose because I'm that good. I'm going to be totally honest with you, though, Stackers. Don't get me wrong. I'm basically the biggest Top Gun fan you'll ever meet, but I'm 
never actually seen it all the way through. I mean, that first scene just gets me so hyped up. I can't even help myself. I just hop in my El Camino, hammer my foot to the floor, and sip off. But on this Top Gun day, I am determined to cool my jets and finish the movie. So far, what I don't get, this is very confusing to me, I don't get why everybody wants to talk about this Maverick dude. I mean, don't get me wrong, he's hilarious and all, but Goose, Goose is the man. That dude is the real inspiration right there. He's the guy that makes stuff happen. So time for us to take this podcast vertical, just like Goose. Here's today's uh, Immelman move question. Which branch of the military has the largest budget? I'll be back faster than you can say, goodness gracious, great balls of fire. Hola, welcome to Spanish Made Easy with me, your host, Jen Hemphill from the Her Dinero Matters podcast. Today, I'm joined by the host of the popular How to Money podcast, Matt Altmix. And together, we will share a popular and simple Spanish phrase so you too can use it in your own life. Sound easy? Sure. Today's phrase is, Tony, I'm not sure your life insurance benefit is high enough for you to pound tequila like that. In Spanish, you would say this popular phrase just like this, Tony, No creo que el pago de tu seguro de vida es lo suficientemente alto como para que tomes tequila de esa manera. Now let's hear the co-host of How to Money, Matt. Try it. Ready, Matt? All right, guys, you chose the right man for the job. Here we go. Tony, no creo que el pago de tu seguro de vida es lo suficientemente Suficientemente <laughs> alto como para que tomos tequila de esa manera. That was that was just perfect. Perfect. See how we sound almost exactly alike. You too can speak Spanish easily and comfortably listening to Stacking Benjamins. See you next time. Ciao. Hey, trivia fans, it's your favorite wingman, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, a.k.a. Goose, if you, you know, want to give me a code name like people do with their wingman, you know, just keeping it real and all. So, you know, even though I'm totally dedicated to be right there by your side, helping you navigate the great blue yonder, I just, yeah, I can't help it. Just like Maverick and Goose buzzed by that tower all the time. I've been buzzing by Joe's desk left and right, and that guy has absolutely no sense of humor. It's a joke, Joe. It's just a joke. I gotta watch the end because the beginning has been the inspiration for my entire life. Goose is the best. That time he said, watch the birdie. (laughs) Oh my God, it's classic. Now I gotta get back to the movie because I'm absolutely dying to see how Goose ends up saving the world. Before I go, how about your good-natured wingman trivia answer, though, huh? The question was this. Which branch of the military has the largest budget? If you guessed the Air Force, you'd be wrong because they're second. With an annual spend of $244.8 billion, the U.S. Army takes the cake for the largest budget. I'm not sure that's something to be proud of, but I got to speed off and finish this flick right now. See ya! I got to say, I didn't expect Air Force to be number two. I thought Navy would have been second, Hmm. especially with the Marines folded in. But I suppose all the expensive equipment around the world that the Air Force has, maybe that, but of course, boats ain't cheap. Eh, Boats are easy. Just a couple paddles, sail. That's all you need. Submarine, just give everybody a nice... uh, Snorkels. Snorkel. You're good to go. Good to go. Yeah. Yeah, I, w- I still would have thought Navy's number two. That's that's very surprising. Big thanks to Kevin for coming down to the basement. Oh, gee, it all comes back down to cost-benefit analysis when you're looking at grad school. But things like things like LinkedIn, like cleaning up your LinkedIn profile, 
thinking about yourself strategically, maybe not getting into so many, we talked about all this crap you can't control, maybe not having so many arguments on Facebook about stupid stuff where you're never going to change anybody's mind anyway, but you will make your new employer go, oh, I see. This Howdy. Is, this is what this person's really like. Mm -hmm. Maybe cleaning that up a little bit and thinking a little bit more about the PR involved of getting a job could be very helpful. I think the most important thing out of all of that is just focus on the stuff that you can control, which is how you present yourself, how you come out, what people see about you, how you look, how you dress, you know, all those sorts of things are the things that will set you apart. They're also going to be the things that set you apart the wrong way too. So do what you can control. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline, OG. We'll tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends over at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. Hmm, things I value the most on May the 13th. Uh, summer and summer. <laughs> it's actually summer your, cocktails. Your loved, your loved ones and your time, which... I do those things on in the summer. the summer. Absolutely. It's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. If you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now, you'll get a free quote. Super simple application. It's all online. You get an instant coverage decision. If you've ever tried to fill out life insurance before, you'll know what I'm talking about. This is incredibly different. Affordable prices. And of course, uh, their parent company, Mass Mutual, is more than 160 years old. So you know you're protected. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to Zach. Say hi, Zach. Hi, Joe and OG. My name is Zach, and I'm 33, and I'm in fairly good financial shape in a stable career field. I recently received a $700,000 inheritance, mostly in the form of stocks, bonds, and ETFs, and have transferred it into a brokerage account. There are large capital gains taxes associated with it. I know a little about investing, but I'm definitely an amateur. Would you recommend hiring the brokerage company to actively manage the account or to try to handle the trading myself? Thanks. Thanks for that question, Zach. The first thing I do is I would definitely send a good portion of that money to your favorite podcasters. Just saying. Always an option. We do have some good news, though, uh, Zach. If this was titled correctly, and OG, maybe you can explain this, but I believe that if, if this money was titled correctly, all these big capital gains he's talking about might not exist. Yeah, depending on what the what he means by I received an inheritance, and you're right, if it was owned correctly prior to him receiving it, there could be little or no capital gains, or there could be a lot. This is... <laughs> This is a really good example of why it makes sense to have somebody in your corner, have a professional help you with this, a tax professional, an investment professional, maybe both, probably both, because mistakes made here start costing a lot of money. The short answer is to your question of does it make sense to have somebody help? I think the answer is yeah, it does, probably. But in the context of an overall strategy and how this folds in with the rest of the planning that you're already doing, you said that you're in a really great shape at 33. This can only put you in a better shape or it can totally spiral you out of control if not done correctly. And the last thing that you want is, you know, an IRS bill for $80,000 or worse, $140,000 that could have been prevented or thinking that you owe the IRS $140,000 and they're not really too keen on proving you wrong. <laughs> You know, yeah. So, yeah. So, this is definitely in the category of somebody's got to look at it with you. To dig in just a little bit more, Zach, to what I was referring to earlier, in a lot of cases, when money passes from one person to another, once again, it goes into titling. That's a whole different issue. But, but if the account is was just in their name, they passed away. You're the beneficiary. You get what's called a step up in basis to the date that they died. So that huge capital gain from the time they bought it, let's say it was 30 years ago, most of that may get wiped out. So there may be very, very little. But if it's titled in a different way, where maybe they owned it indirectly, we don't know any of that. That that basis might not might not be there. So definitely you want a person. The piece OG that really made me nervous that Zach said was, should I have the brokerage house actively manage it? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, oh, hell no. I mean, it should, everything that you do, Zach, should all dovetail together. Because like OG was referring to, when you start thinking about your lifestyle and spending decisions, you see these people with what we call sudden money, like a $700,000 inheritance 
or the million dollar lottery, you see how many of these people go broke. And the reason they go broke is because they're spending it out of shape. They invest in some risky stuff. They actively manage portfolios that never should have been actively managed. They think they have to have a, a big level of sophistication. Everything that you do affects every other part of your life. How you spend money affects how you're going to invest that money. So just hiring an investment manager in a box unrelated to your budget and how you spend money when you want to retire, what big purchases you've coming up, what the goals are for that is you should never do that. I would never, ever, ever in a million years, OG, recommend that somebody yeah. do that. Yep. Such a blessing to have an opportunity to have an inheritance and a rather large sum at that. But also with that, you know, like we've been reminded many times in all of our favorite superhero movies, it also comes with great responsibility. And all of a sudden, you know, if you're like most 33 year olds that I know, $700,000 is more money than exists in all of the world to you as of yesterday, you know, and now all of a sudden it's all in your lap and you start having this sensation of like invincibility and a little bit of like, Oh, this will never run out. This is so much money, you know, and then God forbid you actually tell anybody that you have it because is, you'll have a whole bunch of new friends who will help you spend it. Right. It, yeah. And it, and it, you know, at first I was like, oh, you're being funny, but you're really not being funny. I'm not. If, I mean, I'm, it's it's if, funny to see, not yeah. ha-ha funny, ironic funny, because how do you go out to dinner when we can all go out to dinner again? How do you go out to dinner with your friends? They all know that you've got three quarters of a million dollars in the bank and you not pick up the tab. Remember we had uh, Philip Buchanan on, the pro football player, and he, mm -hmm. and he wrote the book about his mom and his grandma. He had gone a million dollars in debt before draft day just based on the fact that people knew that he was going to be drafted early and he was going to have a lot of money. He went and blew a ton of money. And, and for him, it wasn't even, it wasn't even new friends. OG It was his mom and his grandma. He had to disown his mother. How hard is yeah. that to disown, disown your mom? So yeah, this could either There's be a lot the, of stuff to unpack. This basically. could either be the worst thing or the best thing. And, and here's another side piece of this. I think this is where sometimes the financial community sometimes starts to feel a little takey. Like, how do I get more for me? How do I have enough just for me? Zach's at a point in his life now at 33 with another 700,000 on top of what he was already doing. And he said he was fine. This is an opportunity for a lot of people to think bigger. Now, how do I leave a legacy? How do I impact my community? What are some of the big things I could do that might, might've been, I, I don't, frankly, out of my scope of thinking, how can I make mm -hmm. my thinking bigger to do more? It could be a pretty exciting time for Zach. Yeah. There's a lot of moving parts here. Here's the biggest thing. Nothing is so important that you have to make a decision on it right away. Absolutely. That's there are no, great. there are no decisions that have to be done by tomorrow at midnight, no matter what anybody says. And maybe maybe you'll run into one or two of those things like, Hey, by the way, the tax returns on this need to get done by nine months. Okay. Thank you for that information. I've got nine months to work on it. People get freaked out. They want to do it right. Well, the taxes are due. I got to do it. No, you got nine months. The reason the IRS gives you nine months on an estate settlement is because there's a lot of moving parts and it's okay to take the full nine months. You don't need to invest it differently. You don't have to trade it differently. You don't have to sell anything. You don't have to certainly buy anything. And no matter your decision with any of this, just remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it 100% is. That should keep you out of most of the trouble. Thanks for the question, Zach. If you've got a question for us, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And OG and I would be happy to discuss not just the question you asked. Zach asked uh, a pretty narrow question, and I think uh, we may have given Zach a little more than he bargained for. All right, that's going to do it for today. Hey, big thanks to everybody who's left us a review of this show. Mom's got this one on the refrigerator upstairs, OG. Entertaining and interesting. Five stars from Fern's Sunny Spot. Talk about summer. Fern's Sunny Spot. That sounds like a place I want to be. As podcasts have uh, become more common, Fern writes, they've come and gone from my subscribe list. Stacking Benjamin's one of the few that have stayed for years. The humor and segment style let me... Make it so that at least a portion of the show engages me, even if one part is not a topic I have any interest in. It's funny you say that, Fern, because I have ADD something bad, which is why which is why we made the show this way. They say to make the show for you and hope there's other nerds out there like you. So 
Big thanks for that. Mom is very proud of you. If if the Bridge Club were coming over for the usual Wednesday get-together, they would have seen it. But unfortunately, Mom doesn't know how to operate Zoom very well. So uh, you'll just have to know that we saw it. And thank you very much. Also, OG, as he mentioned a little bit earlier, doing these fun 30-minute uh, give-back sessions. So if you've got uh, some questions that are longer than we can answer on the show, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG, and he'll be happy to, to uh, sit with you virtually, socially distancely, and talk in a no-sales atmosphere, by the way. Be rest assured that OG has no interest in uh, backing you into a virtual 30 minute corner hey uh i'll give your coat back since i've got you here <laughs> i've been meaning to talk to you about your life insurance protection if og starts drawing circles you know if you get three other people to listen to our podcast <laughs> and then they get five other people you'll never need to listen again you'll be at the top of the food chain <laughs> everybody pays you a dollar but first you start paying me a dollar if you move people into their mom's basement and they move four more people into their mom's basement yeah. Uh, stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG for that. All right. Doug, you've got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headline. While we don't know all the repercussions, there are certainly lots of current impacts to the economy due to COVID-19. There will also likely be some long-term impacts as well. Second, take a lesson from Kevin Kiley. Want to ace that interview or fly high in your career? Don't assume that you've got the job. Work your butt off and good things will happen. But the big takeaway? Goose dies. He dies. Are you f***ing kidding me? Uh, um, uh, don't, don't, don't worry, stackers. Your wingman, neighbor Doug, isn't going anywhere. Because apparently... I really got to start finishing these movies. He f***ing dies? Big thanks to Kevin Kiley for coming down to the basement and sharing his great knowledge about how to navigate our careers. You can find out more about Kevin at careerroadmap.com or on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Big thanks to Orson Welles for his discussion of Rosebud. I'll bet that's a great plant. I never understood why he likes plants so much, but yeah, oh well. Oh, uh, huge thanks to another movie that's been an inspiration for me, The Sixth Sense. Heck, all these people seeing dead people. If more people live like this guy's living, wow. Oh, and uh, you know, big thanks to King Kong for climbing that tower. I'm so glad he's going to save that lady. What a nice ape. And thanks to Jumanji for teaching us that games don't need to be violent. Oh, you know, and no thanks to Dunkirk for the story about an army that never gets off a beach. Boy, was that story going south. I just shut it right off. This show is created by Joe Saul Sihai, produced by Taylor Stevens, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and it appears I've fallen and I can't get up. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor.
Please leave your message after the tone. Uh, this is uh, Bill. Uh, I just read in the newspaper that Invesco is supposed to send me a check for $100 million. I'm just wondering uh, when is I supposed to get that because cause I've been checking the mail every day for the last uh, uh, several weeks and have yet to see my check for $100 million as promised in the investment news article from May the 6th. So if you could kindly return my call, I'd appreciate it. It's uh, uh, 214-555-1212. Thank you very much. Uh, hi again, this is Bill. Uh, <clears throat> second time calling. Listen, went to the mailbox again. Uh, I'm referencing investment news article from May in the 6th. And I'm looking for my $100 million. Uh, I understand maybe you don't have it all right now, but uh, just several million would be much appreciated. I've been waiting now over a week for my check, so I prefer not to call again. Thank you. Uh, hi again, sir or ma'am. This is Bill. Uh, this is my third time calling, and I'm going to have to see an attorney about my money because y'all owe me $105 million dollars. And see, here's the thing. I already bought me a boat. Now them boat payments come due. So, well, to be honest, I bought, bought a boat for just about everybody I know up and down here in the trailer park. Everybody got one. Well, not everybody, because I don't like that guy at the very end, but that, that has nothing to do with it. So listen here. I'm going to give you until close of business tomorrow to deposit my $105 million or some number close to it or I'm going to start charging y'all interest because this is bull crapola. I won't be nice on a voicemail. Give me a call back. Tell me where my money is. The mailbox is full and cannot accept any messages at this time. Goodbye.